Welcome to Disambiguation. I'm your host, Michael Fawcett. Each week, we interview experts in AI, generative AI, and business automation to help business leaders understand how to use these tools for the biggest business impact. In our show today, we look at autonomous agents in customer service. I'm joined by Ryan Nichols, Chief Customer Officer at Salesforce Service Cloud. Ryan, welcome. Thank you, Michael. It's great to be here today. Yeah, good, good to have you on. And I, I you know, we were going to try to do this at Dreamforce and I didn't get to, to go for some other family issues. And and I'm so I really appreciate you coming back in and, and let's sit down and talk about this because I this is like one of the hottest topics. And I can't tell you the number of questions I get about this. So uh, I feel like you guys, especially since you're really leading the way on on rolling out Agent Force and, and all the different uh, component parts around that, you know, should be a good conversation. So, you know, before we jump in, though, <clears throat> could you just give me a quick introduction um, for the audience? I know who you are, and uh, <laughs> and tell us about your role at Salesforce. Well, well, happy to. Um, first of all, just so excited to be here having this conversation. Um, thanks for having an after Dreamforce, actually. I think we're able to, with a little bit of processing time, kind of make sense of this topic. And there's uh, there's never a dull moment. There's always something new to uh, to talk about in this space. Um, I've been doing this uh, doing this a while. I've been uh, I'm here as a new role, chief customer officer at Salesforce for Service Cloud, which means that I spend time with our customers charting out their path to this future for customer service. What's their next step from wherever they are today and using our platform um, towards this uh, towards this vision that we lay out at events like Dreamforce. I've come to this role after. A a lot of years of orbiting Salesforce as a uh, customer, as an implementation partner, and as an ISV partner, as a Salesforce Ventures back startup. So it's just been fantastic to to be here at Salesforce and part of the product team, um, building the future of service. Yeah, that's great. Well, I, you know, I, I met you first uh, when I lived in San Francisco, and you were um, were with a uh, Salesforce partner, <clears throat> and so. You know, I'm glad to to see you move into this role, and certainly know that uh, with your background, and I'm sure you have some really interesting stories to tell about customers and how they're using these. So that's, you know, I'm looking forward to that. Um, but can you can you can we start kind of back at square one though? Because you know, I know people hear about autonomous agents, and and there's been a lot of press and a lot of you know, probably hype out there too. But but what what's the vision behind? bringing AI autonomous agents to service cloud and how's this different than more traditional automation on another kind of chat bots and that sort of thing in, in, yeah. in service? It, it's a great question because uh, there's a lot of buzzword bingo when it comes to AI. There always, always has been. So it's really important to focus on, on what's different. And, and look, service leaders are, are in a tough spot, right? They're being asked to do uh, more with less. Uh, customer expectations are higher than ever. And every service leader I meet doesn't have nearly the, uh, the resources to meet those customer expectations doing the same old thing, right? Something needs to change. And technology's uh, been promising to help with that and has delivered a lot of help with that over the years. Uh, we've certainly uh, been at this a while at Salesforce. And it started by you know, applying these machine learning models to make predictions. I mean, the, these models are really good at making predictions, right? Predicting what's the right place to send this customer's question. What's the next reply to send from this list? What's the best knowledge article from this list? And those predictive models um, delivered a lot of benefits, but they came with a bit of inflexibility, right? They needed to be trained. Mm -hmm. You needed to have had a thousand examples, right? In order to make a really good prediction about what, could, what to come next. And about two years ago, right, that changed, right? The availability of these foundation models, these large language models, mm -hmm. um, gave us a real head start on figuring out just the language part of this problem, right? You didn't need to figure out what the customer was talking about. And that allowed mm -hmm. us to move from predicting to generating, right? To not just picking from the list, what's the next best thing to say to this customer, but actually generating a reply, right? Not just picking a knowledge article uh, from a list, but generating a response that's grounded on that knowledge. Mm -hmm. um, so it's a huge step forward, right? And we saw uh, yeah. much more accessibility for uh, AI applying the service by using these foundational models. But we weren't done yet, right? Because while generating content, answering questions is certainly powerful, you know, there's a lot more to customer service than just answering questions. Yeah. And so this next step um, that people, when people are talking about agents, they're talking about more than generating answers, they're talking about taking action, right? Autonomously mm -hmm. taking action on behalf of your customers, on behalf of your employees. And the link between, well, what does that have to do with these large language models? 
that's the interesting layer, right? Is what's in between these new foundational models and this ability to take action on behalf of your customers. Uh, mm. That's the ultimate win-win, right? Helps customers get their issue resolved quickly without a lot of effort and dramatically reduces cost to serve. Mm. I mean, it's been an interesting evolution. And I, you know, I, I'm one of those people that I have had lots of bad experiences with the old style, you know, chat bots and logic tree driven and, you know, just not able to get to what you want. And then of course, just the move to what I call intelligent chat bots, that was a big deal. But now the idea that I could actually get it to take some action it, that that takes away a lot of pressure on the team for certain things. And I would think freeze them up a lot. So that I thought that was pretty exciting, but I, <clears throat> you know, underneath, you can, this, almost, you can almost feel yourself going down with the traditional chat bot, the conversational design I, tree, right? I mean, it's, yeah, it's yeah, as no, a I, consumer it, and the maker of these things, so you annoying. just feel it. You're like, Oh, I know how this was designed. And, and it takes so much work, right. To, gather those utterances, map them to intents, yeah. build a conversational tree. And then the, the end user experience, I mean, bots can do what they're programmed to do very well, right? But when mm -hmm. you get stuck at one branch of that tree, there's no getting out, right? Which is why no, so many no. times we see the agent, <laughs> agent, agent, right? Just give me yeah. something. Yeah, yeah no, yeah. I have been, I have yelled at my phone many times going, person, <laughs> somebody, I want to talk to a human. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, no, but definitely sounds like a better experience. Well, underneath this, though, <clears throat> and then Salesforce has always taken this approach, I think, with things, especially since, you know, the force launch years ago and and this idea of platforms. And now there's this new term that was put out there at Dreamforce a little before, I guess, uh, agent force platform. So how does that play into this? How does it empower, you know, customer service teams to pull these autonomous agents into their workflow? Yeah. Well, it's, it's a really important distinction between the power of um, these large language models and what's required to actually automate customer service. There needs to be, needs to be something in between, right? If you yep. just went out and, uh, you know, asked a large language model, how would I solve this particular question? you're going to you know, get a hallucinated response, right? That's not gonna be grounded on who you are, what product you actually are talking about, what the uh, approved set of knowledge is for resolving these sort of issues. And so, you know, we've long known that just connecting directly to a large language model doesn't do the trick. And that's why when we launched uh, our first set of generative features, we added a trust layer, right? So that you could use these models in a trusted way. Um, we added an LLM gateway, There's so much, innovation happening in these models that uh, we don't, you don't want to have just one horse in the race, right? You want to be able to benefit from who's got the new model and how do I use it uh, to best serve my customers? We added grounding, right? We knew that you needed to uh, ground these models in uh, data that's coming from your enterprise, right? Your knowledge, your customer data, previous co conversations you've had with the customer, mm -hmm. and you don't want your customer data mixed up with these large language models or being used to train these large language models. You wanted to have something in between. So we started with that uh, with that layer, right? In between your data and then your, uh, mm -hmm. your uh, the, the power of the large language model. And what we've done with Agent Force is add something on top of all those amazing tools, right? We've added mm -hmm. the ability to um, define what you're trying to accomplish, to give a particular mm -hmm. job to be done and define it. And to create an agent that has a particular role, that has access to a particular set of data, and is armed with a specific set of actions that are oftentimes just the same actions that you've uh, armed your uh, human customer support reps in order to handle. Just arm your uh, AI agents with those as well. And then really importantly, guardrails. Like what mm -hmm. should you always do? What should you never do? What are these instructions that keep the agent on track? And this new layer of defining these, ag these agents to solve certain jobs are really, they make multiple calls to an LLM. This isn't just assembling one prompt, right? right? This is sending one uh, call to the LLM to say, okay, given this situation, what should I do? Let's form a plan, right? And then for step one of the plan, let's make another call to the LLM and come back with a response. Okay, now given how the customer responded to that, let's make another call to the LLM, all in purpose of this goal. And so you know, some it's referred to in different ways, these agentic systems, like it's turn by turn thinking. It's it's really the best way to get the power of the large language model to, to accomplish specific tasks in customer service. Mm. I mean, one of the things you said in there, I think is really important. And, and a lot of uh, a lot of has a lot has been written on it. I have 
written a fair bit about it too, I think, but uh, is this idea of giving the, the model the context to actually be accurate without giving up the data to the model, <laughs> which is you know obviously an issue if you're using your customer data. So I, I think that's really interesting that, <clears throat> that, and this was a progression that I watched, you know, move to data cloud at Salesforce, then the trust layer, then this, you know, uh, uh, capabilities to do retrieval augmented generation and and use contextual data, tying all that together so that you eventually got to the, oh, now we can do, we can now do more than just generate content. We can have it do things, which is, you know, the ultimate in in all sorts of places in your business where you could automate things away that, uh, that you don't really want humans doing. Um, you know, I, I did a I did a survey for a client last year on customer communications, and one of the things that I pushed on a little bit in that survey was, what do people think about chatbots? And you know, if you ask somebody straight out, and we were you know we talked about this a little bit before, um, if 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 you ask somebody straight out, they're going to go, I don't want to talk to a chatbot. But if they are talking to an intelligent chatbot, they may not even know. And then secondly, if you give them the capability to go to a human easily. If they get frustrated, then they answer, which I called hybrid, that that was like almost uh, 100% of people were comfortable with that kind of model, the hybrid model. A few people still didn't, but but that's probably because they had those bad chatbot experiences, right? So I think that's really interesting that it's it does seem like that's where we've gone, gravitated to as we've built this out. Yeah, I think it's important that we not try to pretend, right, these, that these AI agents are human agents. It's really important to disclose that. That's part of our, you know, ethical and human use guidelines for the use of this technology. But I think what you're, what you're onto there is that you don't think of it as a chatbot, right? I mean, what you associate sometimes is, oh, this thing is in the way. This thing is meant to, you know, mm -hmm. deflect me, right, from getting what I really want, which is help with my issue. If something right. is there to, if it feels like it's there to help and it actually accelerates you getting what you need, then you don't think of it in that way, right? Mm -hmm. Then you, you reframe and you say, oh, this thing is, boy, it's sure better than waiting on hold, right? Like just give right. me the answer that I need. And when something is there to help you in that way, then I, I think we see a very different consumer attitude towards it. Yeah, no, I, I definitely saw that in the survey and in conversation since then. So I maybe to make this a, seem a bit more real for people, could you come up and I know you talk to um, service cloud customers all the time, so I'm sure you can, but could you give us a specific example of where a customer's using an AI autonomous agent and it's significantly improved their service delivery or customer satisfaction? Yeah, there's uh, it, it, great stories is what Dreamforce was all about was telling the stories of customers that are on this journey from those that um, already have a live agent force agent that's engaging with their customers mm -hmm. to trailblazers that were at Dreamforce just getting started. We had thousands of customers mm -hmm. uh, get into the agent force platform and leave Dreamforce with their very first agents, right? That they mm -hmm. were able to ground on their website and give a few simple instructions. And it's just been so exciting to see folks all along that adoption journey. Mm -hmm. um, one of the stories that we were really excited to spend a bit of time on at Dreamforce was the story of SACS. And Saks, of course, luxury retailer makes these beautiful products um, that people just really love and make part of their life. But sometimes you want to make a return, right? And uh, Saks has had a uh, an Einstein chatbot uh, help folks with that return process and have had that live for a few years. And there are a lot of spots where it performed very well, right? When it was a pretty straightforward return process, but a few mm -hmm. spots where it always got escalated to a question. And in particular, uh, or to a human agent, and that drove up costs in the contact center. Um, when they're contact center agents, they really want to be spending time advising customers, right? And what's right. what's going to go well with this thing that I just bought, or what should I buy next? And that's, of course, how SACS also turns you know their contact center to not just a, a cost center, but also yep. a driver of growth. That's it's those sites of conversations, not you know how do I return this item, mm. right? So taking the conversations that were about return policies. And not just escalating those straight to human customer support agent. Mm. Uh, that was where we started, right, with with Saks. And um, Saks had a goal. They wanted to go live uh, before or Dreamforce, before <laughs> they're highlighting the <laughs> keynote and before, of course, their big um, holiday rush. And so right. they were able to extend um, their uh, Einstein bots implementation with a agent force service agent that was armed with a, a pretty simple set of instructions. 
uh, we created a, um, a, a new topic, right, for this agent. We said, all right, your job here that we're assigning you to do is to handle questions about returns. And here are your instructions. And we, we copied and pasted these instructions straight from the handbook that the, the human contact center agents were given, right, when they start at SACS. Yeah. These weren't, this wasn't, you know, training a model, right? This wasn't assembling utterances and cleaning up your data mm -hmm. and calling in the data science team, right, to map that to intents. This is just pasting in human language instructions. And one example, right, of the type of issue that I just thought the agent was really uh, well able to uh, handle was a complicated issue around uh, monograms. Like you can get, get your SACS item sometimes mm. monogrammed with your initials. And those items can't be returned, right? That's one of their return policies. Makes sense, right? It's been personalized. There's another instruction, right, that we gave the service agent, which was if we ship you the wrong item, then of course that can be returned, right? Not only that, the shipping both ways is, mm. is on us. So now live on the SACS website, right, we were testing right before the Dreamforce keynote, like how does it perform when, when both those instructions mm -hmm. are invoked? Like what if we ship to you an item where your monogram shirt had the wrong initials, right? And I think, uh, you know, Sophia is the, the name that was given to the SACS uh, agent force service agent. <laughs> Sophia did a better job, but I think most human customer support agents would have done with this issue who would have found that first policy of monogrammed items can't be returned and said, sorry, you know, I can't, I can't help no. you with this. <clears throat> Sophia generated a very different response, right? Sophia acknowledged the general policy, but then, but given that our initials were wrong, this is the incorrect item and then generated an instruction mm -hmm. for here's how to initiate the return on our self-service portal so that it gets through the system. Because if mm -hmm. you mark it as monogrammed, we're not going to, it won't go yeah. through, but if you mark it as incorrect item, it will. <laughs> and that set of instructions, of course, that's just the first step. We next want to arm it with the ability to actually conduct the return for you. But yep. this was live, Michael, in a week, one wow. week from kicking wow. off the process of like, all right, let's identify the contact drivers that are getting escalated most. Let's create these topics. Let's do these actions. Well, this was a one week project. And we were able to take one of the top things that was being escalated to human agents and, uh, and and have it handled by a service agent. And we're just seeing so many of these examples. Um, you know, Wiley, a uh, big textbook manufacturer mm -hmm. and distributor, um, <clears throat> seasonal business, right? Everyone's back to school. They yep. saw 40% more cases resolved using Agent Force than with their traditional wow. uh, AI approach. So the, the results are there wherever customers mm -hmm. are in their customer journey. Well, and it, and it sounds like too that it's a it's a progression. Uh, in the Sachs example, you know they they replaced something that wasn't really working well in what they were doing with something that interacted well and directed the customer to something. But then over time, they could turn that into it just does that for them, and and then there's not that separate oh go to the customer service portal, and so that would make the experience even better. Yeah, the, the process we sometimes guide customers on is, look, get started with answering you know, questions, right? That's mm -hmm. a, it, it still requires work to gather your knowledge, oh, yeah. right? To, um, you know, make that available, right? To the agent. Next step is to fetch information, right? To not just give general answers, but give right. personalized uh, answers. That requires a lot of times either identifying the customer or authenticating them. Uh, that's mm -hmm. why having uh, an autonomous agent that's sitting right on top of your customer 360, is so powerful, right? For those personalized responses. Right. And then the third step is taking action. And again, a lot of Salesforce customers are off to a running start there because mm -hmm. they've already created all the every single flow that you mm -hmm. have written to arm your uh, human customer support reps, every single Apex mm -hmm. button that you've added to your service console, like all of these um, automation capabilities mm -hmm. that you've already built into the platform can right. be turned into actions that can be used by the agents um, very simply, right? You basically wrap it with a little bit of metadata where you describe like, what is this for? When is it to be used, right? What are the guardrails? And then you add it or associate it with a particular service topic. And then the agent knows when to evoke it, right? The agent will mm. make a decision about, okay, here's when to call this particular process to run this workflow. And again, very different approach than the traditional yeah. conversational design approach. Hmm. So, so we talked a, a bit about hybrid before, and I'm curious in this scenario, how, how do the agents interact with the human agents? And then how do you, is there training required for that human agent then? And if there is, what, what does that, you know, what does that look like? How do, how do, how do you roll this out, I guess, with the human agent and make them, you know, work collaboratively? Yeah. It's a, it's a great question. I think a lot of the implications 
are implications that come over time. I mean, the initial experience, right, of uh, being escalated a conversation um, is not one that it needs to be all that different from what happens today. Mm-hmm. Um, the conversation that uh, was held with the Agent for Service Agent can be summarized. So the, the human customer support rep just sees exactly what's been happening before uh, and can dive right in assisting with those issues. Um, so we don't find this to be like a big retrain moment in order to get started, right? In order to, mm-hmm. to roll these things initially out. And in fact, the ability to call in your, uh, a human customer support rep when required, that's an important uh, aspect mm-hmm. of every agent force agent, right? It's one yeah. of the, the escalation uh, uh, action, right? Is, is one that every agent force agent kind of ships with um, because it's, it's really important to call for help, right? To not just yeah. make up an <laughs> answer, right? Yeah. The human customer support rep involved when we need it or when it's a great yeah. opportunity, right? If somebody's asking about, um, you know, style questions, we can generate those answers too. But Sachs has found that, hey, their advisors are really good at turning those conversations into mm-hmm. um, you know, uh, just great opportunities to expand a customer's relationship with Sachs. So you want those to go to human agents. And that I think points to what's going to be required over time, right? Because we'll see a few things happening, right, with our human customer support teams. One, um, the degree of difficulty, right, of the issues that mm-hmm. aren't able to be automated, right, by our uh, uh, self-service AI means that the things that do get through to your uh, customer service team are going to be more complicated, right? They're going mm-hmm. to be either um, especially urgent, um, especially emotional, especially complicated. Mm-hmm. And so guiding our human customer support teams to um, to really spend time in those issues, right? To, they're going to mm-hmm. be able to spend time on those issues because we've freed up so much time with the, uh, with the simple stuff. Um, we're going to have to measure our customer support teams differently because Average amount of time, it's going to go up, right? It's going to take longer to resolve these uh, issues. And yet you're going to be able to, on average, get customers the help they need faster because so much mm-hmm. is being resolved on self-service. You can it, it makes sense to spend a little bit more time on these complicated things that um, come to our, uh, our human support teams. And mm-hmm. I think the SACS example is a great example, something that we're seeing more broadly as well, uh, of turning service uh, from a cost center into uh, a value creation engine, a revenue driver. Um, we do the state of survey, a uh, state of service survey. Uh, every couple of years we ask, uh, you know, 5,000 service leaders what's going on in their business. And one metric that's been changing so much, Michael, over the last couple of years is the percent of service leaders that say mm. that they measure their performance based on contribution to revenue. And that's gone from uh, barely 50% when we started doing the survey to 91% in the wow. 2024 wow. results. And 85% of those service leaders that do uh, that do have a revenue metric say the revenue metric is higher than it was last year, right? Service leaders are mm. being asked to contribute to revenue and they're being asked to contribute more to revenue. And I think this presents a great opportunity to take um, what fundamentally is... Um, is a it, you know can be a repetitive job of answering the same questions every time to mm. hey how do we turn this into a more human job to make a connection right to build a relationship to express some empathy and then to to figure out what is this customer's path to mm. taking the next step forward with the brand like what are they going to enjoy what's the next mm. best thing that they should be doing and that's uh, that's something where I think human customer service agents they mm. are going to need some training in order to do that that's really different than. Um, just doing a, a simple break fix or answering a question, but mm. it presents a great opportunity, I think, for businesses that employ uh, large customer service teams. Yeah. And I mean, a real opportunity for that human agent to advance their career and learn some new skills that they wouldn't have been able to otherwise, or at least would have been a difficult path for them, I guess. You know, one thing you said in there, Ryan, <clears throat> that I think is interesting too, that I didn't really think about until that until you talked about a bit is the shift in metrics because mm-hmm. we've all known in the, <clears throat> you know, in the, in the CRM customer service world, we've, we've known for a while that the idea of call deflection is not really a very good one. Like that doesn't make your customer happier <laughs> if you're, if you actually have that as a metric and in fact, probably in sense some wrong behavior somewhere mm-hmm. down the line. Right. So if you could shift that focus to, you know, a lot of the automation is in fact doing that first call resolution, but it's not the part that you're really focused on anymore. Focusing on revenue, focusing on, you know, the relationship. That's a different way to think about customer service for a lot of companies. Yeah, I agree. It's a, I don't think we have that single North Star metric just yet, mm-hmm. right? I think that certainly, um, uh, uh, you know, time to first resolution 
including self-service, right? Self-service resolution rates, satisfaction with those results. I mean, at the end of the day, you just want to be as focused on the ultimate customer outcome as you can and uh, as close as you can get to that. Ultimately, we want to see, you know, that net promoter score, that customer lifetime value kind of moving in the right direction, what the intra metrics are, right? That give you a leading indication that you're on the right track. Sometimes you need to change pretty dramatically. Mm. Yeah, that, that that makes a lot of sense, I think. And that and that'll be, I mean, from a cultural shift, that's probably a little more difficult change for some organizations than others, but but it is something that they'll have to address. I you know, speaking of challenges too, what <clears throat> what are what are the main challenges that you're hearing? And and obviously it's still pretty early. So we may next year we may have this conversation again and maybe we'll you know, we'll know a lot more about what that looks like. But what are the challenges that companies are encountering when they develop and deploy these autonomous agents in service cloud? Well, we think a lot about these challenges because our whole roadmap is oriented around helping customers overcome these challenges. And if I had to put one at the top of the list, it would be data, right? Data fragmentation. Right. Every conversation I have with customer about their AI strategy ends up becoming a conversation about their data strategy. And it's one of the reasons Salesforce has invested so much in data cloud over the years. Yeah. And um, I, we, we were incredibly fortunate. I don't think this was the original idea behind data cloud, right? It was serving a different purpose <laughs> at the very beginning, but boy, has it served to be an incredible way to bring together uh, the data required to uh, ground agent force agents, where yeah. being able to, to act on this data, to ground on this data as if it's on the Salesforce platform without having to move it uh, to the Salesforce platform, right? To have this zero copy uh, ecosystem of partners right. where they, because so many companies are investing in data lakes. They're solving this problem for multiple reasons. And to be able to bring that data and act on that data in Salesforce to ground their AI models, incredibly mm -hmm. powerful. It's one of the reasons why we launched um, unified knowledge, uh, knowledge data, especially fragmented in so many different companies and right. being able to bring in that data um, uh, in October, you'll be able to bring it right into data cloud, right? And act on it in data cloud as mm -hmm. unstructured data uh, to be able to do incredibly powerful retrieval augmented generation rag on that unstructured mm -hmm. data, regardless of where it's sitting in your enterprise. It, these barriers of how do I bring together my, uh, my knowledge my uh, customer data, and then the final mm -hmm. piece is conversational data, where we've seen that you know the CTI integrations that have always existed between your contact center system and your CRM just aren't good enough because they don't mm -hmm. bring in the real-time conversational data that you need to uh, ground these large language models. And so the deeper integration that's made possible with you know, bringing your own channels, right, to service cloud voice or digital mm -hmm. engagement, plug them in so that you've got your knowledge, your customer data, and your conversational data mm -hmm. all together in data cloud. That's the right foundation that you mm -hmm. need to, uh, when you think about, like, what are the questions you're going to ask, right? Well, how, what are your agents going to need in order to respond effectively? They need to go know what your source of truth is and knowledge. They need to know a lot about who they're talking to. And they need to know how the conversation has been unfolding, not just in this conversation, but previous conversations as well. So in a word, it's data. How do you bring all your data together yeah. to ground these models? Yeah, and I mean, also traditionally, Salesforce automation data was always a bit suspect, and that's kind of the the start of it. And then there was also all the fragmentation. So that was actually one of the things you know in the old CDP, you know, customer data platform approach, then moved into more of a, a broader, you know, not a marketing tool, but a broader tool to to get data across the entire uh, process of interacting with customers. So that I mean, that's exciting, and I can see that would be. It's a challenge, no question, but it is at least a, a path now. You, you know, we, we talk about um, customer centricity and customer 360, and it ties into this data question, of course. But I'm also curious how this ties back into the, to the autonomous agent, particularly around, and you mentioned personalization before, you know, and a more human-like interactions, I guess, really, how, how does... How does that tie together with the agents? Well, it, it all comes down to the prompt and augmenting the prompt mm -hmm. with the right um, set of data to personalize the response. And mm -hmm. there's just a, a huge difference between what you're able to do when you were training your own models and trying to come up with the right response to a question to, in, you know, in the prompt studio, you're able to just mm -hmm. at mention right, entire corpuses of data about your customers, you know, based on um, 
at customer record, you know, and considering mm. all of their, you know, at previous personal uh, purchase history, right? And mm. uh, be sure to remember our at last conversation, right? You can bring in all of those things into the context that gets sent to the prompt, given all of those things, what's the next best thing to say to this mm. customer? That's a, re you get a really different answer. You get a personalized response that uh, is grounded in all of these previous interactions and all the data that you've assembled, you can now put it to use in Prompt Studio and then make that prompt one of the actions that the agents know when to call, right? Know when to mm -hmm. call that, you know, that, that, uh, that service reply prompt to say, okay, what's the right next thing to say here? Um, so they really go hand in hand to have the right data underneath and then to have uh, the right way to bring it into your prompts with Prompt Studio. And then to have the agent framework know when to call on those prompts in order to mm. uh, achieve a certain outcome on behalf of your customers. Mm. And, and, it's, and it's almost like <clears throat> you're you're trying to come up with this balance between um, kind of our, our our ideas around empathy and human touch versus automation and and uh, you know and 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 assisting that customer as quickly and as accurately as possible. How does how does Agent Force the, the platform tie companies in with this? And and empathy has been a topic now for you know a couple of years around the the language models uh, because it isn't obviously something that at least today the AI has inherently but there is you know some way to create synthetic empathy i guess in the way that this is built so is that is that a concern in there as well yeah this is it's an active it's an active area right uh an active area of of research and well, boy, I, I will. I've stopped making predictions about what these <laughs> large language models are going to be able to do. Right, they're moving so so quickly. I do think that there's something, especially about empathy, where where the empathy comes from is as or you know it's more important than what the words say. Right, right. this is why having a you know a bot say something that might. You know, out of the words of a friend, this would sound empathetic, but when it's coming out of a bot, it's not going to sound, it's not going to have that emotional impact on me because what right. matters is that there's right. another being who is taking the time to express this to me. Mm -hmm. And so this is where I think the primary impact on empathetic customer engagement is going to come from the things that make it so hard for our human customer service agents to really express empathy. And mm -hmm. it's the clock. Right. It's yeah. the ticking average handle time. How long have you been on this call? You need to get off this call. There's no time to understand this customer's issue or what's behind them or mm -hmm. um, or why this is such an emotional topic for this customer who's calling in. You don't have time to do that because you got to get on to the next call. And I think the primary impact we're going to have on empathy is to to spend the time on those types of customer situations that require the human touch by bringing up, you know, a lot of customer service doesn't require, you know, much empathy at all, right? Where it's like, look, right. I don't, I don't want, I don't need empathy. I just need my issue fixed, please. Right. Mm -hmm. And those sort of customer service issues are just so ripe for automation, right? Where let's handle all of those and then spend the time that we need to be spending mm -hmm. by connecting two humans together. Uh, one representing a, oftentimes a beloved brand, you know, the other who's struggling with an issue and they just want an answer. Let's connect those two humans. They're going to do amazing things to work it out. Yeah. We just haven't, we don't create the time for those sort of conversations because there's so much noise in the mm. system and stuff that should be fully automated. Mm. Yeah, that's a good point. I mean, if you if you can automate out uh, out the things that are, um, you know, I if I call, I have a problem with my 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 cell phone. I just want to get an answer. I'm not really looking for somebody to to go. Oh, I really you know understand how painful it can be if you don't have your cell phone. Like I just want an answer. So there there are definitely a lot of those interactions that if you could just automate away, you'd free up more time for the human to be a human instead of being on the clock. That that's, that's a really good point. Um, so how, where do you see this going? Like we, we, you know, we've been talking about all these different interesting things that we can do, but what are you, you know, what advancements, what features um, could we expect over the next year or two in the, in the agent force platform? And, and how do you, how do you see that evolve over time uh, with those capabilities for, for your customers? Well, so after, uh, after 
just saying I'm not going to make any predictions. You know, these are not these are not predictions. <laughs> that's why I, that's now. why I asked the question then. <laughs> <laughs> things that are things that are actively being worked on, right, are certainly things that I love to talk about with, uh, you sure. know, a, the giant safe harbor statement in front, right, that, of course, these are our best <laughs> efforts to get these capabilities live. But um, one of the things we were able to show off at Dreamforce um, was um, uh, channel selection. Uh, we're launching H4 service agents um, over um, uh, digital channels, right, over messaging, uh, in -in messaging experience and messaging experience on um, SMS, WhatsApp, Facebook Messenger, right? You'll be able to, mm -hmm. Apple Messaging for Business, you'll be able to get out on all those digital channels. Um, up next is voice. And we recently announced an acquisition of a startup that is helping us bring the Agent <coughs> Force platform to voice. Because voice has really presented some unique challenges um, for um, uh, generating content. The, the latency required, there's some real nuance to, um, so to speak, to getting interrupt right, to know when you're being interrupted, when to interrupt a customer. Um, and that uh, is just a special skill set that we're very lucky to now have as part of Salesforce. And that's going to help us um, expand the Age of Force platform to voice. Mm -hmm. And really this idea of being multimodal, right? At launch, again, it'll be text back and forth, but being able to send in an image, um, not just to attach to the case, but actually as part of the conversation to understand mm -hmm. that image and to have the model um, build a plan and react to that image mm -hmm. based on the information that it's in the image, that's going to be incredibly powerful. Mm -hmm. And while there's a lot of attention given to the conversational back and forth, one of the things I'm most excited about, Michael, is, is how it's not everything needs to be a conversation, right? That mm -hmm. uh, there's a digital experience part of every customer experience that I think there's um, some really interesting back and forth that we're going to start to see. So mm -hmm. uh, shortly after general availability, uh, we'll have our agent force agents be able to um, interact with the self-service experience, the rest of the self-service mm -hmm. experience, so that as we're having a conversation, again, instead of just telling you how to do something, let me just take you there, right, in the in the product mm -hmm. or the service or the website or that, that part of the mobile app. Let me just take you right to that spot and maybe even with most of it filled in, right? So mm -hmm. having the intersection between the the, uh, the conversational experience and the digital experience is, is something that, that I'm power, uh, really excited about. Those are all pretty near-term innovations. I think mm -hmm. that the richness of, of capabilities and the number of actions that uh, these agents are going to be able to take, those, those are just going to explode. I mean, those are mm -hmm. going to go from relatively simple actions today to um, highly uh, complex actions that require um, a lot of back and forth. We're going to see um, a lot of that. Are, is it going to get to empathy? I don't know. I'll hold off on predicting uh, human empathy, but I think uh, we're going to be able to make a lot of time for human empathy, um, given all these incredible investments and uh, advancements that we're going to see in the Agent Force platform over the coming mm -hmm. releases. Yeah, I think I wrote something about um, synthetic empathy about a year ago. So I, I'm interested to see how that evolves and and uh, and gets to the point where it does actually feel em empathetic versus I think the machine's acting like it cares, which, you know, that's not great, I guess. Anyway, well, so Ryan, that, that's uh, that's you're really out of time. Although I, I, you know, good conversation, and I certainly could uh, keep going. I think this is a really interesting area and and evolving very quickly. Um, before I let you go, though, I always like to ask at the end to get um, the guest to recommend somebody, you know, a thought leader or an author, somebody that you think the audience would really enjoy uh, checking out and and following and you know learning from. So uh, I'll give two answers to this question, Michael, both in kind of an unexpected direction, right? Because so much is possible, right? With um, AI and applying AI to solve these problems um, that relate to our work. I think that it's on us as leaders to keep our imaginations active, right? To have a really strong perspective on where we want this to go and to imagine the future that we want to manifest through this incredible new technology. And so for me, that, uh, that, is two different directions. Like one is in fiction, right? And going back to some of my, mm. my favorites to imagine what a future could look like, both in incredibly bright ways, as well as really dark ways. And yeah. uh, boy, I love Fall, uh, you know, Dodge and Hell by Neil Stevenson. I think that there's just a, uh, like a, a, a novel that invites us to reconsider like what is paradise and mm -hmm. imagine how technology can help us create that or the exact opposite. That's the sort of thinking that I think we need our leaders to do. Like where mm -hmm. do we want this technology to take us? And I also love how Cal Newport in his work on deep work and slow mm -hmm. productivity 
invites us to think about how um, we can take this hyperactive hive mind, right, that has driven so much of knowledge work, right, over really this, this last wave of technology. And you think about how do we quiet that, right? How do we quiet that and invite in the, uh, the deeper, more productive things that, that, that humans are uniquely gifted at, right? Connecting with others, right? We want to make time for that and uh, being deliberate about that and firing up our imaginations for what work could be like. I really like the, uh, the work of Cal Newport and his, his uh, new book, Slow Productivity is a great read. Yeah, great. Oh, the ver two very good recommendations. Much appreciated. And I'm sure the audience will enjoy. Well, Ryan, uh, thanks again for joining today. Really enjoyed the conversation. Really enjoyed the conversation as well, Michael. Thank you for having me. And that's the show for this week. Thank you all for joining. Remember to hit that subscribe button. If you enjoyed the show, please leave us a five-star rating on YouTube or your favorite podcast platform to help others find the show. For more on AI and other software research reports, briefs, and blog posts, check out arianresearch.com. If you have AI, generative AI, or business automation expertise, either as a provider or as an end user, Email your information to disambiguation at arianresearch.com, and we'll see if we can get you on as a guest. Don't forget to join us next week. Disambiguation is an Arian Research production. I'm Michael Fawcett, and this is the Disambiguation Podcast.